Greetings, and welcome to another exciting episode of Veronica Explains. I'm Veronica, and today I'm going to talk about the IBM Model M keyboard, perhaps the most iconic individual keyboard in the history of modern computing. I'm also going to share how you can get it working on a modern computer running Linux, Windows, or Mac OS using a SORS converter, a very cool adapter which makes using this legendary keyboard reasonably simple. But first, let's talk about the history of this fantastic device. In the early era of personal computing, different manufacturers used varying layouts for their keys. While the QWERTY layout itself was pretty standardized, at least in countries with Latin script, there was lots of variation on other keys such as arrows, function keys, and other modifier characters. Sometimes, this can make working with a retro machine kinda challenging. Take my VIC-20 for example. This machine from 1980 has the arrow keys in this very unique location and requires the shift key to go up or left, an arrangement that feels archaic in the modern era. The Model M, on the other hand, feels pretty much like a modern PC keyboard, except of course for the missing super key and menu key. Now, there's a good reason this layout feels so familiar. IBM and their clones came to dominate the personal computing market by the late 1980s, particularly in business computing, but eventually pretty much everywhere else. Unlike some other companies, IBM put a fair amount of work into testing different keyboard layouts. They also borrowed some great ideas from other keyboard layouts, particularly the keyboard from the legendary DEC VT220 terminal. The end result was a fantastic improvement over other keyboard layouts, and thanks to IBM's dominance in the market, the Model M layout essentially became the standard for all computers to follow. For the first couple of years, this keyboard was a premium option for IBM's line of PCs and terminals. It was made the standard on the PS2 line, and most other keyboards have copied the layout ever since. So okay, it's a progenitor to modern keyboards, but so what? What else is so special about it? Basically, it's built like a tank. First off, it's not what you would call a mechanical keyboard. A mechanical keyboard uses a complete switch mechanism for each key. The Model M is probably the most famous example of a different technology, the buckling spring keyboard. Basically, it's a spring that collapses when pressed, providing a particularly satisfying audio and physical click. Yep, satisfying. The spring mechanism itself on a buckling spring keyboard typically sits on top of the switch, which is usually either a capacitive or membrane switch. A switch mechanism that is not too dissimilar from modern non-mechanical keyboards. In the Model M, the regular keycaps themselves are two pieces, one that sits atop the spring, and another sitting on top of that. The membrane which contains the actual key switches is housed in a very robust protective housing thing, and all of this means that the Model M is exceptionally durable. The Model M was sold with IBM's machines starting in the mid-80s first with their terminal products, and then with their PCs and servers. Eventually, IBM spun off their keyboard manufacturing along with some other peripherals to a new company called Lexmark. They're still around, I think, but they aren't making keyboards anymore. And it should be noted that not all Model M's have buckling springs. Some later models do have cheaper rubber domes, similar to inexpensive keyboards which we're all probably familiar with. Anyway, these iconic keyboards are often pricey, particularly when cleaned up and well cared for. Few other used keyboards fetch the kind of price you'll see when buying a Model M. You can, however, pick up a new one from Unicomp, a company which sprung out of Lexmark exiting the keyboard scene in the mid to late 90s. Unicomp Model M's are a little different than these classic ones and feature quality of life improvements like a smaller housing and extra super and menu keys. They also come with USB connections, which is certainly convenient. 
If you just want the feeling of a buckling spring keyboard and don't want to bother with the sourcing of an original, the Unicomp Model M is a fine choice. Anyway, as much as I've enjoyed my Unicomp Model M, the chance to use the same keyboard I had as a kid was just too good to pass up. This one right here popped up at Free Geek Twin Cities a couple weeks ago, and I knew I had to get it. I picked it up as soon as I could, it's here, and confirmed everything was working as expected. Near as I can tell, this is the exact model of keyboard used by the IBM PCAT which I believe was the specific 286 I first learned to type and code on. It uses a 5-pin DIN connector, also known as an AT connector, to connect with the computer itself, and has the telltale silver IBM square badge in the upper right-hand corner. So for me personally, this is the peak of nostalgia. Unfortunately, this particular model had a bunch of stickers on it, which of course I don't remember from my youth. I don't know for certain what exactly these stickers were from, but some folks at the Free Geek Discord seem to think it might be from a Multimate word processor sticker overlay, and to me that makes about as much sense as any other explanation. Now, I'd keep these stickers on if they were in great shape, but these are not in great shape. Just to be clear, I know some of you will wince at the fact that I removed these stickers. I don't know if they came from the factory like this, but honestly, the glue was deteriorating and frankly, it was just gross. So I decided to clean them off of the keycaps completely. I decided against a total and complete teardown of the keyboard, mainly because the keys themselves are currently working just fine, and I figure I'll wait on a total teardown until I decide to bolt mod the keyboard, which I'm sure is coming. For those that don't know, bolt modding is when you remove the plastic rivets inside this keyboard and replace them with metal bolts, which some folks say helps improve the experience. There's some debate about that, so leave me a comment if you think I should do it. I'm a little torn on the subject. For real, this isn't one of those times where I'm saying leave a comment so that way, you know, the algorithm works. I also want to hear what you have to say, so leave me a comment if you think I should bolt mod this thing. And speaking of bolt modding and comments, a quick disclaimer. I'm not a keyboard snob. I tend to be a use the tool you like to use kind of person, and honestly, that's how I feel about keyboards. I really don't care too much about things like N key rollover or capacitive versus membrane design. Up until this point, my day-to-day -day keyboard has been the launch keyboard from System76. It's a fantastic compact keyboard, but I've found myself drawn back to full-size keyboards as I'm spending more and more time editing video. This is entirely a personal preference thing and isn't casting judgment on any other keyboards or any other types of keyboards that might be out there. Yes, I know they exist. And yes, I know various other hardware mods exist to convert one of these more permanently to QMK or USB or whatever else you fancy. But I want an easily reversible solution in case I run across my old 286 somewhere. Veronica. What? It could happen. Anyway, some of you undoubtedly will want to debate about Model F versus Model M or the benefits of various hardware mods, and that's fantastic. Just be aware that for my needs, I'm only interested in a keyboard that feels good and reminds me of my youth with the PCAT, and that's about all. Anyway, first off, I took the keycaps off carefully, including both parts of the cap. I soaked those in some dish soap and water for a bit, then scrubbed each cap clean. I then let them dry for 24 hours because obviously I didn't want to get water inside the mechanism. 
I then did everything I could to clean the disgusting gunk out from under the keys. Yuck. When the keys were dry, I started reassembling the keyboard, taking care to properly seat the stem of the keycap over the spring. I only had one spring come loose, the end key. Luckily, I was able to stretch it out a little bit and then get it reseated, but I suspect this will not last very long. I'll follow up with that in a future video if it ever becomes an issue. When the whole thing was reassembled, I had a bit of a moment with it. You know, I didn't expect to get emotional over this. Hey, Ami. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed staring at the keyboard I learned to type on. It just feels incredible. I'm glad I found this. For testing purposes, I was able to use it on my modern computer with an active PS2 to USB adapter, coupled with a passive AT to PS2 adapter. Keep in mind that you can't just use any adapter to hook one of these up. Not all PS2 adapters are compatible with all keyboards. Older keyboards may not have the requisite controller to be able to speak to a USB connection. And while you can use some off-the-shelf active adapters to hook this thing up, I wanted something with a bit more flexibility that would be plug-and-play on the various pieces of equipment I use throughout my work. And that's where the Soarer's Converter comes in. This adapter contains a microcontroller inside the USB plug, which can adapt your Model M keyboard to a modern machine. The Soarer's Converter can go further than simple adaptation, though. It can let you remap keys, establish layers, and even set up macros. I picked this one up on eBay for about $40 American, and I'll throw a link in the video description. Please note, though, that different Model M's use different connectors. Many use PS2 connectors, but mine uses this 5-pin AT connector, and still others use terminal connectors. So as always, your mileage may vary. Make sure you buy the right thing for your keyboard. And before you comment about XModMap or AutoHotKey, sure, you can use software-based solutions to remap keys. For me personally, I'd prefer a plug-and-play adapter with no fuss once I set it up, as I frequently move my keyboard to other machines or operating systems for testing purposes. I don't want to fiddle with software from one machine to the next. I just want it all to work. And that's what we're going to get with the Soarer's Converter. Anyway, the Soarer's Converter is named for an apparently mysterious user on a keyboard forum named Soarer, who appears to be the first to implement this conversion on a microcontroller. I don't know much about this individual or what the process looks like to build a converter myself. As a matter of fact, most of what I know about this converter actually comes from another website entirely, sharktastica.co.uk, which I'll link in the video description. Whoever you are, thank you for your awesome work. When I received my Soarer's Converter from eBay, I tried it right away with no configuration, and as expected, it worked out of the box as a simple adapter. But the magic in the converter is the key remapping, and in my case, I have two keys I'd like to remap. I'd like to convert the right alt into a super key. This way, I can use the associated super key based shortcuts in Pop OS, as well as triggering the open Apple key when working on a Mac. I'd also like to remap Caps Lock to Escape because I'm a Vim user and thus punished enough without having to stretch my pinky all the way to the Escape key at the top left corner of this beast. So let's take advantage of those fantastic key remapping features. To start with, I downloaded the firmware zip file from the Geek Hack website and extracted it to my home directory. I believe most commercially available converters use firmware 1.10. At least that's what I've seen in my research. Navigate to the extracted directory, and you'll see the folder has four subdirectories, configs, docs, 
firmware, and tools. Configs has some sample configurations in it. The configurations are text files with a .sc extension. The docs folder is, well, docs. Organized into a simple local HTML website, which is pretty easy to navigate. You're definitely going to want to make use of those docs if you're working with alternative keyboards to the Model M, like the Model F or some of the 122 key keyboards that are out there. The firmware directory contains microcontroller firmware, which is useful if you're building an adapter yourself. I am not, so I'm going to skip that for now. The last directory is the tools directory, which is the important one for our purposes. It contains separate archives for Linux, Mac, and Windows, as well as the source code. On whatever system you're on, extract the archive file. I'm on Linux, so I'll choose that one. Now, I've read that on Linux, the toolset requires 32-bit libusb libraries, so you may need to install those separately. On Ubuntu-based systems, you can install this with sudo apt install libusb-0.1-4 colon i386. On Fedora, you'll need libstandard C++ and libusb-compat-0.1, both in the i686 target. I'll make sure to leave these commands in the description. On Arch-based systems, you'll probably just tell me in the comments how to do it. You always do! From the appropriate subdirectory inside the Tools folder, I can see six programs, but we're only going to be covering two of them today. SCAS converts a text config file into a binary file, which can be flashed to the converter itself with SCWR. Now, there are some sample config files in the configs folder for you to peruse, which may be useful if you want to get into some of the advanced features. I created a simple config file here in the configs folder called veronica underscore layout dot sc. This code file format appears to use the number sign as a comment, so I added a quick comment at the top of the window. Then I added a remap block statement. The end of the block is indicated with end block, and inside that block, we can indicate the key to remap and its new value. I used two spaces for indenting, and no, there is no need to argue in the comments about tabs versus spaces. I'm not interested, and you don't need to tell me what you think. Now, for some terminal or specialized keyboards, your key mapping may not work out the same as what I'm about to demonstrate. But don't sweat. I'll include a link in the description to a useful utility to help you figure out what keys do what on your specific keyboard. That said, if you have a standard Model M, from what I can tell, you probably won't need to use it. Mine is pretty basic. Inside the remap block, I indicate that I want caps lock to remap to escape, and I want R alt, the right alt key, to remap to LGUI, the source converter name for the left super key. I save the file and exit Vim. Then we navigate to the appropriate tools subdirectory for our OS. We then execute SCAS, passing in the layout file as the first parameter and a target binary file as the second, ending with the .scb extension. This binary file is what will flash to the converter with the scwr command. I used sudo because I believe scwr is going to need root privileges to copy files to the firmware. Your mileage may vary on other systems. If everything works as expected, you'll see a device complete message. If the converter was not found, or you see an error message about libusb, check out the help documentation in the archive folder or Sharktastica's website. Once the flashing was complete, for me at least, I had to unplug my keyboard and then plug it in again. But after that, it was smooth sailing, and my pinky very much appreciates the quick access to escape no matter what OS I'm on. Now that we've done a remapping, let's try a little macro. Let's say I want to replace the pause key on my keyboard with a link to my merch store, where you can buy awesome t-shirts such as this one. 
It's easy enough. Simply reopen the .sc file and let's add a new block, a macro block. Inside the macro block, we add macro pause to indicate this macro should start when the pause key is pressed. Then we indicate each key to press with the word press, like so. It might also benefit you to insert delays, as these macros appear to sometimes run faster than the key presses themselves can be registered. We end the macro with an end macro statement. Then we have to end the block and then write the binary file to the source converter. Now, when I press pause, I save a few keystrokes, letting folks know a great way to support the channel. Hint, hint. Of course, one of the biggest advantages to this flashable, customizable adapter is that I can move it from computer to computer. And these adaptations worked flawlessly on every device I tried it on. So is the Model M and the Soarer's converter worth it? Well, for me, it absolutely is. I grew up with this keyboard and the ability to use it again with minimal effort is extremely worthwhile for me. Of course, and as always, your mileage may vary. If you just want the buckling springs and you don't care so much about the nostalgia, a Unicomp keyboard is quite possibly a more reasonable investment. It'll have USB and super keys out of the box and it's probably easier to use in the long run. And if you just want clickiness or you're a competition gamer or something, you might want something with mechanical switches and N key rollover. But from where I sit, this was an excellent investment. I spend hours and hours typing each day, and this keyboard feels so great to use. And looking down at this classic IBM badge reminds me of growing up. And that reminder of where we came from is, for me at least, absolutely worth the energy. Maybe it is for you too. It's time once again for Ask Veronica, where I answer a question from the supporters of my channel. Today's question is, why is COBOL still a thing? One, two, three, four! COBOL is still a thing because a lot of software was written a long time ago and is still being used today. COBOL was a pretty heavy investment for a lot of companies or governments or banks back in the day. I know I, for one, have never really struggled finding gigs as a COBOL dev, which is surprising to some of my friends who work with more modern software, such as JavaScript or Klingon. Regardless of what happens in the future, there's still gonna be a place for COBOL devs, at the very least in understanding the history of how we got to the current point we're at today. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated with it and why I think I'm gonna keep being fascinated with it for years to come. And if you'd like to help support the channel and maybe get a question answered on the air, you can find membership links at support.linux.mom. Tiers start at just a buck a month, and it's probably the best way to help support the channel. You can also buy a nerdy t-shirt like this one at vkc.sh merch. In any case, I am so grateful to all of my supporters and to all of you watching. Thank you so much.